Hello, and welcome to Diabetes Deep Dives. My name is Candice, and I'm from Diabetes Canada. If you are new to our video series, thank you for joining us. If you have been enjoying this series, welcome back. Our Diabetes Deep Dives video series is designed to go beyond the surface of general diabetes education information. We hope to spark continued interest and learning to leave you with practical tips and tools that you can easily use. We drop a new video every month, so subscribe to our YouTube channel and click on the notification bell to be notified about new content. You can also check us out on social media to find out when the next one will be posted on our YouTube channel. Thanks to those who have subscribed and supported our video series. For this episode on exercise, sport, and diabetes, I'm very excited to share with you that our guest speaker is Chris Jarvis, a former Olympian rower who has been living and competing with diabetes. He is also the founder and executive director of I Challenge Diabetes, a nonprofit that focuses on creating opportunities for people with type 1 diabetes of all ages to overcome challenges and find support. Chris will be sharing his experiences of developing a playbook of sorts that helped him manage his diabetes while competing and participating in his sports and adventure challenges. After watching this video, we hope that you will understand the different types of exercise involved in fitness, as well as training for sport, how the body's physiology is impacted by exercise, the potential benefits of exercise and the challenges with managing diabetes while training or competing in sport, how technology can support your diabetes management during exercise and what to look out for, and how training for a sport can build resilience in the face of diabetes stigma. While this is a very interesting topic, we recognize that the content in this video may not be relevant for everyone and will depend on what your experience with diabetes is and what devices are available to you where you live. If you have specific questions about your diabetes management, please reach out to your healthcare team. These videos are for educational purposes only. The content discussed in this video is not intended to be medical advice. And to the extent that medical advice is required, you should consult with a qualified medical professional. The information discussed in this video cannot replace consultations with a qualified healthcare professional to meet your individual medical needs. The views and opinions expressed in this video are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of Diabetes Canada. As always, we hope that this video sparks your interest in learning more about diabetes management. And now over to Chris. My name is Chris Jarvis, and I have been living with type 1 diabetes for 28 years and gotten into some pretty extreme exercise myself. Some of you might think of rowing as a type of sport that you float around in a boat, but I got into this sport and got pretty competitive and uh, got pretty fit. That's me there training for the Canadian Olympic team. I have been able to row for Team Canada as well as bring back gold from Rio de Janeiro. Um, and, you know, this is a sport that has not only pushed me with my diabetes, but torn my entire body to shreds as I trained for seven hours a day, over 70 kilometers every day. But I've also done a lot of other things. I have been lucky enough to bike across Canada, raising money for a cure. I have been able to uh, join a team of type ones and race in the Canadian death race, 125 kilometers of running up and down some mountaintops. Um, as you can see there, 17,000 feet of elevation change, um, all done in 24 hours. Uh, I have also been able to do lots of leisurely fun uh, trips with our adventure team with I Challenge Diabetes. Um, and some of those adventures have led to some extreme places like the West Coast Trail, which I've hiked eight times, completed with a group of type 1 diabetics. As well, I have um, pushed my own boundaries, uh, completing some mountaineering with uh, a role model that I've looked up to with my diabetes. Um, and that pushes our bodies in so many different ways when we're doing different types of sport. Um, and so I just thought I'd give you a little bit of a background on some of the things that I have uh, done. So getting back into it, if you're uh, pushing your body, it doesn't need to be something extreme, but doing intense physical exercise can push our bodies. And we need to learn about how to manage our diabetes in the midst of that. And our bodies are the best way to give us feedback on that. So I've got a few topics for you to speak to today in our deep dive. And I wanted to speak to you about um, a 
training playbook, something that I've learned to use to adjust uh, from play to play on how to make a quick change in my diabetes management. And that all stems back from how sport affects our blood sugars and the physiology that we're looking at. So we'll give a little uh, dive into that. We're also going to look at the, the pros of how exercise has helped, but also some of the challenges that we face, um, the stigma and the mindset and the resiliency that we gain and the technology and the tips and tricks that I have for that. Now, as we dive on in here, talking about intense exercise, um, there's four main components that we're addressing. Physiology, the technology that supports us, our mindset, and the pros and cons of doing it. So the first part here is to talk about the physiology and the type of exercise. And there's been a lot of research done on this. We know that there are generally uh, a few different kinds of exercise. So you've got your strength training, that's building up your muscle mass as a general thought. Aerobic, that's building up your, your lungs so that it can handle a lot of uh, heavy breathing. And then your anaerobic is when you're not actually using your breathing to power your exercise. So it's very short bursts of exercise, whereas aerobic could be long hours of exercise. Uh, even in the five minute range would still be aerobic exercise. Um, but your breathing is doing the most of the energy uh, component for that. And then you've got your flexibility and balance training. That's still a type of uh, physical exercise that we want to be doing. And um, when we think about the research into diabetes and how this uh, impacts us, mostly we try to associate a type of exercise with the, um, the corresponding phys physiology. So as you see here, we're looking at sprinting up at the very top. Um, that's going to be an anaerobic exercise. And what that arrow is trying to say is that sprinting might push your blood sugars up. Weightlifting is on the up side. Okay. And then you've got mixed sports, which might be more in the middle. So basketball, soccer, you're thinking about bursts of exercise that also have stopping points. Burst, stop, burst, stop. So those are from, from our um, hypothetical, you know, from our, our research side, might say that it is a more balanced approach um, versus, as it shows there, a bicycle ride is going down and a jog is going down. Um, and so that's because there might be less stopping and starting from a hypothetical situation. Um, now, I say hypothetical because... I think all of these exercises should com uh, comprise all of the types of exercise. If you want to be a good sprinter, you don't just do sprints. If you want to do the maximum push in your weightlifting, then you're probably going to want to do a whole lot of other uh, strength training activities than just maximal efforts. So for example, when I was weight training, I would be doing two to three reps to try to build up how much maximum could I push but I'll also be doing exercises with 12 reps, 18 reps. And, um, and so because I was a rower, I would also do uh, weightlifting with a lot more reps as well. Sometimes uh, bursts of, of sets where I would drop down from 20 reps of one, drop some weight off, do another 15 reps, drop some weight, et cetera. So there's lots of different kinds of weight training is my, is my point there. Um, and so especially when you get into um, different sports, you know, hockey would be one of these ones that is trying to say a straight line approach or even a spike approach, but that's not going to be every time you play hockey. In fact, we often talk about how practices vary greatly from a competition or a, a race or a game, depending on the sport. And so those psychological components start to play a factor um, and they start to influence what happens with our blood sugars as well. So while this is still a very valid uh, a tool that we can look at here um, to see what, what is the general concept of a sport, if we dive into something like cycling, I have seen many times when I was to get on a spin bike uh, that within 15 minutes, my sensor readings would change from upward arrows to downward arrows. So when you see something like this, you know, I would show you um, a snack over here is something that I would do to try to prepare my body so that my blood sugars wouldn't drop into a low. And then I would wait until I see those arrows going up to protect myself. And then I would start my cycling exercise. 
And then as you can see, as I finish, my blood sugars start to taper off. Of course, you can start to perfect this. So just thinking about this type of reading and using um, your body and learning about your activity, this could be any activity for you. And if we take that snack and we say, did this snack work? You can see that my blood sugar rose and then it also descended. And if my blood sugar stayed in the right target range at the end, that tells you I took in a right about the right amount of carbs. And now if we look at it and say, could I do any better? Then maybe I want to move my, uh, my snack a little bit later in the game. So the same blood sugar profile, but just demonstrating that if I ate that snack 15, 20 minutes later, maybe my, sp my spike wouldn't have uh, gone quite as high. And so that's a great way to work within your blood sugars, learning your sport that yes, cycling is going to drop my blood sugar based on what my readings show, but that snack is a little bit too early in order to stabilize my blood sugars. And we can see some very stable blood sugars when we get practicing and doing the same amount of sport. And we should also be a little bit safe when we're trying a new sport. And so if you saw your blood sugars spike up and stay there, you know, don't beat yourself up because that's a safe way to start a new exercise. And maybe after a few times, if you see the same trend, then you might want to back off and not eat as many carbohydrates, which I'll talk about again in a moment. Um, so getting back into it, this is, uh, you know, hopefully demonstrating to you that as any athlete, when you think about somebody who's competing at the Olympics, you realize that they're doing a whole bunch of different kinds of sport and adjusting their strategy each time. It's not as simple as some of your friends might think, of course, but if we keep on working with our tools and our tips um, and adjusting our playbook for each of these types of exercise, then we might get a more stable approach in each one of them. And each one of them is so important for our health and our, and our um, experience. So this uh, chart and this idea of the different types of exercise and how they affect our blood sugars is really helpful because some of us might be frustrated that you know we're doing something really hard and it doesn't have as much of an impact as maybe going shopping at the mall or gardening, going for a walk. These forms of exercise are really good for us and they are proving this by impacting our blood sugars. While it can be pretty frustrating to have a low blood sugar in the midst of one of these activities, we should note that the uh, more continuous forms of exercise are very helpful for our bodies, um, just the same as, as the ones that push our blood sugars up. But you shouldn't be frustrated that a lower form of exercise that you're not pushing yourself as hard can still bring your blood sugars down. It's really about adapting our strategy. So another component of adapting our strategy that came along is called the X-carb factor. And so a scientist came up and we've got charts online that give you some identification. But as I mentioned, you really, it's your responsibility to try and figure out how much carbs are required for your type of exercise. So this as a concept is taking in, this chart might be hard to see, but you can look it up online, is that taking your exercise, say cycling as we just looked at, and determining how hard are you going, and then identifying a certain amount of extra carbs, X carbs is the short form, the certain amount of carbs that you might need per hour to manage that exercise. And so you wouldn't take insulin uh, or you'd cut this back from your medication to try and balance out your exercise. That way you don't need to treat low blood sugars. So as an example, if we are looking at a, a light form of cycling, maybe 20 grams of carbs is the ideal. As you step it up and you go harder, maybe it's 30. And if you're going full steam, maybe it's 40. And so you kind of come up with that and that way you've got a plan for each exercise. And this is gonna change. It's not just per person, but it's per exercise. Now, taking that into account, we should also remember that our glycemic index is important. So if we have a lower range blood sugar as we're starting, we're gonna to wanna to eat higher glycemic index. And I won't get into that uh, in too much detail here, but the idea being that we can look at our blood sugar levels as they currently are to determine how fast do we need the energy to come into our body. And we can also think about our snacks if we're doing a long endurance exercise that we might want to have a meal that's going to last longer into our exercise period. So a lower glycemic index meal would help for a long endurance activity like a hike, like a long walk that you're going on um, or a busy day.
Okay, the last big piece of physiology I want to talk to you about is about the timing. Now, I like to break my workouts down into different zones. And so what I notice is that leading up to my exercise, um, as I mentioned in that uh, cycling shot there, I want to get my blood sugars kind of angling up. Um, now, that's because I usually do cardiovascular exercise or aerobic exercise. So my blood sugars would trend on the downward side if I didn't do something to counteract it. So this pre-exercise period is something that you work out when you know what your exercise is doing. If you're doing a stressful activity like a, a game or a race, um, and you notice that your blood sugars spike up during that activity, then you might want to do uh, the opposite where you're being really sensitive about um, managing your, your diabetes so that your blood sugars don't spike up. On race day, for example, versus uh, training, um, in training, I would be eating my breakfast about 45 minutes before my exercise, and I would take a very small portion of insulin for that carbohydrate because of the X carb factor. I knew that I needed more carbs for the exercise without insulin. So I would uh, adjust my ratio so that I would get extra carbs for the exercise for training versus on a race day. There were times where I would be uh, watching my blood sugars and taking my insulin and waiting for that insulin to take action. And because of the stress involved in a race day, um, there were times where I would be waiting for 45 minutes and my blood sugar would continue to rise without eating any food yet that morning. The stress was pushing those blood sugars up pre-exercise. Uh, and this can make it really tricky because then as you get into the exercise, things can change. And that's why I say the timing. So when I shift into the next zone and I start getting active, um, as we just spoke about in a race day format, the, uh, the stress of it could change um, based on the activity. So usually in my warm up, I'm watching and I could see those uh, stress uh, hormones pushing my blood sugars up, shift very quickly into a drop. And so um, that's all I'm trying to identify here is that if you see a shift, that might be because your physiology is changing. The stress hormones are being abated because of the activity. Now, it could be opposite to you. And the idea here that I want to present is that you watch the timing of the zones. During your exercise, you know, you're going to want to watch what that trend is and then try to come up with an appropriate counteraction. Um, so... In most of my exercise, even in, in race day format, during the warm up period would be a dropping blood sugar. Whereas just the race alone, my races were five minutes long. So they're a heavy load of anaerobic exercise. And so that is going to be pushing um, all the hormones into that body again and pushing my blood sugars back up. So that's a little shift in my warm up to the race period. Um, but in general, we're looking at the type of exercise and what's happening with our blood sugars and then coming up with a plan. And then, uh, one thing that we noticed is that not only anaerobic exercises push our blood sugars up, but also long cardio periods can do so too in the recovery phase. So in the recovery phase, I've got a little wiggly line there. And a lot of times people will find that even after their exercise is over, their blood sugars could continue to descend. It could continue to drop. And so you want to think about even uh, in the aftermath, if you need extra carbs to balance out those blood sugars or a reduction in medication, insulin um, could help to balance that. But in some cases, like I mentioned, uh, endurance athletes will find what we now call the whip. And I was experiencing this time and time again after my practices, especially in the morning where my blood sugars would go from a... Um, sensitive phase where it was wanting to drop to a spike phase. And before I even got a chance to eat anything after a two or three hour long practice, my blood sugar would spike up. And so if you've experienced something like this, you're not alone. Um, but that's what we're watching for is when we finish in this into this recovery phase, does the trend change? And so if you're watching for that, that could be in the most immediate time after your exercise between, you know, right afterwards to an hour and a half or so um, before that recovery phase starts to shift. So there's a bit of stubbornness that can happen there that can push blood sugars up. And we want to watch for that phase in the timing. 
And then I've also got delayed or overnight. Um, and that's because we should understand that our bodies are recovering from all this exercise. Our muscles need to be replenished. During the activity, our muscles are using all of their storage. There's storage inside of our muscles for energy, and we need to replace that. So it's a lot easier for insulin to get energy into our muscles during an overnight period or when we're resting, delayed much after our exercise. And so that's why a lot of people have experienced nighttime lows after exercise because our body is just replenishing those muscles. And so we need to have a little bit of a, a careful approach to the uh, overnight uh, medication that we take uh, to manage our blood sugars. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention about inside of our exercise period is that our body has a physiological shift. Uh, usually our body is picking up energy from our intestinal tract, from our digestive tract, and trying to bring that into the bloodstream to start to fuel the rest of our body. Okay, and that's when we're eating food, that's where it's getting picked up. But when we're exercising, our body can learn to shunt the blood away from that intestinal tract. And so what's happening there is that the body knows that it has enough storage in its muscles as well as in the liver where it stores a lot of energy. Almost 40% of our energy is stored in our liver. And so our body should be producing a counter hormone to insulin called glucagon. Um, but in most people with diabetes, that glucagon function is inhibited. It's not working properly. So that's why it's so hard to treat a low blood sugar during exercise because the body is breaking it down, but it's being put into our digestive tract and the blood's not going there. So this could cause a, a big challenge for people who are doing endurance exercise, uh, who are um, doing that aerobic exercise because the body is trying to pick it up from the liver, but there's no glucagon response to pull that energy out of storage. So I often suggest to people to think about uh, delaying the swallowing of your low treatment. And sometimes people will slam back juice or Gatorade really quickly um, and then get right back into it. And then they end up going low again or staying low. And so this is an idea uh, that I could suggest to you is to try to keep something either gummy, even if it is juice or Gatorade that you want to do, try to take it a little bit slower because the more you put into your stomach, I've heard from many people who've had three, four juice boxes and still their low hasn't come up until the end of their exercise. And then of course, it's going to spike up much higher than what we want. So that's something that we uh, should be watchful for and um, aware of to try to slow down our low treatments and keep our energy in our in our mouth um, so that we can actually pick up some of that energy from the gums, um, which isn't inhibited at all. So it's a really quick absorption in our mouths. So chewing on some gummies, um, there's lots of different products like that, uh, energy gels that work really quickly that are designed for athletes because of this type of symptom even those that don't have diabetes. So that's uh, another idea for you. Um, but to just reinforce that these different timing zones can change and make it pretty complex when we're managing our diabetes. But it certainly um, is possible if we are putting our minds to it. As I mentioned, all these little timing pieces and the physiology pieces we're tracking with modern day technology these days. Uh, here I am at the top of one of the mountains in the Assiniboine Provincial Park, uh, looking at my uh, glucose sensor, and it patches right into a pump. And I'm not going to get into all the details of this, but as you know, there's multiple different kinds. This is Medtronics with the Smart Guard feature. Um, that's going to be balancing all of the uh, changes in your physiology uh, from day to day to adjust your insulin dosages. Um, there are also self DIY versions of this, like Loop, as well as um, the tandem version with Dexcom compatibility. And you see there, there's a little bar right up in this corner and um, it's dark red. And that's because the pump has shut off the insulin delivery during that period to protect you from a low. That's what a lot of this artificial intelligence is doing at this point, combined with the technology of glucose sensing. Um, and it's something that we should be all thinking about in the background is how much active insulin do we have? Active insulin is a whole other topic, but really it's just saying how much is in our body and how much is going to be um, encouraged by our exercise. So when our insulin is stimulated by our exercise, it's going to do more work. And so we see that little period there where the uh, insulin is being shut off because the background insulin is being too powerful, or perhaps uh, a bolus of insulin has become too powerful. 
Um, and so that's uh, really where we're thinking about with all these timing features. The X carbs could also be reduced so you don't have to eat as much carbohydrate. You could reduce the insulin in the same amount. They're equal um, as we uh, work through that. And so one thing that I really wanted to focus in on here, because this technology we could talk about all day, um, but one thing that we are seeing is that the insulin pumps are being uh, reduced in their insulin delivery based on our blood sugars, which is fantastic, especially during these uh, aerobic exercises, as we spoke of. Um, during the evening times when we're going to sleep, this these technologies are making our lives so much safer uh, as we can sleep peacefully without low blood sugars interrupting our nights. Um, but additionally, I wanted to point out uh, one thing that is sometimes a bit of a problem where we have a correction ratio built into our um, artificial intelligence. And so if you have a pump that's using the sensor to adjust how much insulin you're getting, certainly it helps protect from lows during exercise. As you see here, there's a bit of a low blood sugar on the screen. And one thing we got to watch out for is that as we recover from that low, if we treat the low and our blood sugar starts to climb up, then the sensor might indicate to the pump that we need a shot of insulin and it might give us a correction factor. And so I really encourage you to check out with your uh, clinician, your team, if you're dropping after one of these spikes in the midst of your exercise and having a yo-yo effect up and down, um, treating low, getting back into exercise, um, having a blood sugar climb up and then a correction bolus from the pump to bring you back down. That's something that I've seen a lot in our programs as people are learning how to use these technologies and something that I'd watch out for because if your blood sugar is climbing up quickly as it gets to eight or nine, uh, the pump will probably respond with a correction bolus that could bring you back down very quickly, uh, sometimes in as fast as 15 minutes, change those arrows from going up fast down to a quick descent. So technology can really help us out, but there are also little things that are going to come in and we got to watch out for those. And so I want to make sure we also think about our mindset. Now, as you think, <clears throat> everything in life, you know, could affect you up or down. Diabetes is a pretty good parallel for that. So with our technology, we've come so far in the last 30 years since I was diagnosed. Far more people that I've met that have had diabetes a lot longer than that. And so think about that place that you come to. And there's going to be um, great examples of this. Um, and I'm going to use rowing. And so many people don't know what rowing is. And it's my sport. And I have people that come across and interact with me about my rowing in a negative way. And it can frustrate me. But the same thing is going to happen with diabetes. We're going to have people that don't quite get it, that don't realize how much effort we need to put in every day in order to manage this, in order to be at our best or to get up on top of that. And there's a lot of stigma around diabetes, for sure. So find that place that you can come to and stay motivated because sitting on the sidelines at any point because of an illness like diabetes is going to be additional frustration on top of all the physiological challenges that we have. It's the mindset there too. So that builds in us a determination and a resiliency. And I just encourage you to explore that and to recognize yourself for it too. Because if you think the top athletes in the world with diabetes are going through these same moments that are having the same discouragements, it's actually what made me the most proud of myself when I looked back from the Olympics, back on all the days of training that I put in. Certainly there were lots of training accomplishments, but it was really about having that mindset to overcome the daily obstacles that diabetes brought in the way, in addition to all the other training experiences that I had. So when I think about the pros and cons, I think that's a great place to start. You know, we might be thinking about what we're looking for in life, and maybe it's a beautiful view that you're trying to hike towards. Maybe it's uh, a spot on the podium, or maybe it's just being with your friends at that stage. It could be the way you look at yourself as well looking at yourself and being proud of yourself. Those are all big pros, but sometimes we're going to think about ourselves as someone living with diabetes in a negative way because we're frustrated that we can't do everything without having a blood sugar that goes out of control. Or maybe we're focused so much on our blood sugars that we're looking too deeply at that. And when I say too deeply, if it's looking at a negative experience and it's changing our, our lives in a negative way, then there's a problem, right? 
And so we have to focus on blood sugars and the food that we eat and the way that we manage it way more than anyone else does. So that's a, that's a pretty big challenge, but it can turn into a pro, right? As we look to overcome that and find the fun out there. So the more we value those positive moments, the more energy we have to come through the challenges. And so that's been built up in me. And I know looking back from when I was diagnosed at 14 years old, having those challenges present themselves so regularly and having the right support around me to get me back up that I could enjoy the next experience played a big uh, component in how strong I ended up getting. So I would say one of the biggest pros is making sure that you can develop that positive team relationship, whether or not that's with your friends on a team, in a class, or your family. And diabetes can raise a lot of conflicts because this can interrupt not only our sport, but also a lot of parts of our lives. But practicing for a sport is very similar to what we're doing with our diabetes management. Practice, practice, practice. So I encourage you to get out there and to know that you're not the only one. So many people out there across Canada and across the world are going through this too. So I thank Diabetes Canada for bringing us together in this deep dives and uh, remembering that there are more people out there that are doing your specific sport. And so this is just a deep dive on exercise and intense training, but there might be somebody with your specific sport that you could reach out to. I know I've talked to rowers all around the world, hikers all around the world, and I have loved those moments. So I encourage you to get connected beyond this video, to use this as a taste test um, for what you can learn and how you can grow. And I appreciate spending some time with you today. Thank you. And Best of luck to you in your training. Thank you so much for joining us in diving deeper into the world of exercise, sport, and diabetes. Again, this topic may not be relevant to everyone living with diabetes, but we do hope that you found it interesting and learned something new. Please take the opportunity to let us know what you learned, what you liked, and how we can do better. You can do that by posting a comment in the comment section below or by clicking the link to the feedback survey in the description box. If you have ideas for other topics that you'd like to learn more about, you can include that in the comments or feedback survey as well. Chris talked about X-Carbs, as well as DIY automated insulin delivery. We've included links to a resource on X-Carbs, as well as to our deep dive video on DIY AID in the description box, as well as some additional resources related to diabetes and exercise. We also wanted to take this opportunity to let you know about Lace Up to End Diabetes and encourage you to join the Lace Up Your Way Challenge, a great opportunity to get moving, create, or join a team and support Diabetes Canada. For more information about Lace Up or anything related to diabetes management, please visit our website at diabetes.ca. You can also email us at info at diabetes.ca or call our info line at 1-800-BANTING. That's one 800 226-8464 and speak to one of our information and support specialists who can address your needs. Thanks again for joining us and see you next time.